Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us for Medical Grand Rounds, first of uh, 2021. Um, we have um, a, a very prominent outside speaker to start the year off, uh, Dr. Charles o. Wiener from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Wiener is Professor of Medicine and Physiology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's also the president of Johns Hopkins Medicine International. Uh, Dr. Wiener received his BA degree from Duke University and his MD degree from the University of Miami. He went on to house staff training at the University of Washington and then served as medical chief resident there. Um, he received his pulmonary training from the Hammersmith Hospital in uh, London, England and also Johns Hopkins University and then uh, has spent the rest of his career at Johns Hopkins. He was initially interested in a pulmonary uh, vascular response uh, to hypoxia and uh, worked with uh, Dr. Greg Semenza, who uh, you may know recently received the Nobel Prize for his discoveries in hypoxic signaling. Um, Dr. Wiener established his career as an outstanding um, clinician educator. Uh, he has served as the vice chair for education in the Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University and the director of the Osler Medical House Staff uh, Training Program. He is currently, uh, he also has served as the dean and CEO of Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine in Malaysia. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Wiener and I really look forward to his seminar today. Please put your questions in the Q&A box uh, and uh, the chief residents and I will, uh, will uh, address them during the discussion period. Dr. Wiener. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. It's great to be here. And, and I will also say that uh, it's, it's fantastic. I was supposed to be there in person in September, 2019. I, so I had to cancel and God dang it, I've, I've been uh, regretting that a lot. I'll also point out that uh, David made the comment about my friendship with Greg and my collaboration with Greg Semenza. Uh, it was actually Greg who convinced me to um, pivot from becoming uh, from being a scientist to a clinical educator, and I'm forever thankful for that. What I'd like to talk to you today is about the history of truth, um, paradigm change in medical education. By the way, this is the University of Colorado uh, logo, which I looked up. Uh, you guys were founded before us at Hopkins. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't read Greek, that means that says, let your light shine. Um, I got interested in this topic when I was part, I spearheaded a curriculum reform at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where we totally revamped our medical school curriculum. And I'm going to, I'm kind of going to give you about 2,500 years of history leading up to that reform, because I think it's relevant to all of us who practice medicine. Um, I have to start with disclosures uh, and, and please understand, and I apologize for the fact that I was trained by Rick Albert. Um, I am neither a philosopher nor a historian. Um, I'm a clinician and an educator, as David said. Uh, this is a fairly Western centric view. And one of these days, I'm gonna think about this more in terms of the Eastern view, but right now it's very Western centric. Uh, one of the people who got me interested in going into medicine was Lewis Thomas's book, Lives of a Cell. And I looked, I found this distressing quotation from Lewis Thomas uh, when I was reviewing some of his work, because um, I fervently disagree with it. Um, and he said, one reason why medical history is not much taught in medical schools is that so much of it is an embarrassment. Uh, there are certainly embarrassments. There are certainly things we got wrong, but I think much of it is uh, a, a noble thing that we should be doing more of, not less. So my objectives are um, to convince you or at least make the point that I'm convinced of, that we are in the midst of the next paradigm shift in medicine. We're well into it now, actually. And therefore, medicine, medical education and training should shift along lines because they should always parallel clinical medicine. And I have here a couple of views of uh, former uh, doctors who did not represent us well. Um, so, Let's, let's define some things here, facts and truth, because I said I'm going to talk about the history of truth. Uh, Faulkner said facts and truth don't really have much to do each, with each other, and Rudy Giuliani said it even more eloquently when he said truth is not truth. But for definitional purposes here, facts are data points that are preferably reproducible. They are what is observed. They are the data that we collect. 
Uh, they are often dependent on technology. And as we collect facts, we uh, put them into a story, into a narrative, and that we call our truth. So our truth is how all of our facts fit into or conform to what we believe is true. And my point that I'm gonna make here is that truth is dynamic. Facts are collecting, but we always have to be ready to reinterpret our truths. William Osler, um, the first physician in chief of uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, who I will quote a few times today. Um, this is him writing his textbook, Principles and Practice of Medicine. He said it more eloquently, obviously. Uh, he said, like a living organism, truth grows and its gradual evolution may be traced from the tiny germ to the mature product. Much of history is a record of the mishaps of truth that have struggled to the birth only to die or else wither in premature decay. Or, and as you'll see from a later quote, or the germ may be dormant for centuries awaiting the, fu uh, the fullness of time. And once again, Osler would, uh, hit the nail on the head and was very prescient. So starting when I use the word paradigm, I'm using the word paradigm in a very, and in not, in not the cheapened MBA way that everybody seems to use it. I'm actually gonna uh, use it in the uh, reference of this really important book written by Thomas Kuhn in 1962. This is what the second least readable book I'll mention tonight, today. Um, this is one of those books that a lot of people say they've read, but really nobody has, uh, called The Structure of the Scientific Revolutions. So in that book, um, Kuhn appropriated the word paradigm to his own purposes. So the word paradigm means an outstandingly clear or typical example or an archetype. But what Kuhn said is that for the context of sci the scientific revolution, a paradigm is a set of beliefs that are sufficiently unprecedented to attract an enduring group of adherents away from competing modes of scientific activity. And that sentence, you can see why it's a, a relatively unreadable book, but also a paradigm is sufficiently open-ended to leave unresolved questions for investigation. So what he's saying is the paradigm is the truth, scientific truth that we believe in at the moment. And what he went on and why this book is so important is not because he redefined paradigms, but he said that scientific progress, and he was actually not talking about medicine, he was talking about chemistry and physics mostly, but it's very applicable to all scientific fields. And what he said is that scientific progress occurs via paradigm shifts. It does not advance in a linear fashion. So he defined the term normal science, and that is the research that goes on within a paradigm. And what he find, what he highlighted is that there would be inconsistencies or what he called novel facts that come out of the current paradigm and they stress the paradigm. They don't conform to the paradigm. They are data points, they are facts, and they don't fit into the truth that you believe in. And what he said was that, so that research under one paradigm is a strong stimulus to induce paradigm change. And these shifts were often precipitated by technology. So what he was proposing is that science would progress in a linear fashion. And then every once in a while, it would just take these sudden paradigm shifts or tectonic leaps as it were into a new way of looking at things and um, a new way of believing things. Uh, he also pointed out that a new paradigm must seem better than its competitors, but need not explain all the facts. And the way I look at this is that the new paradigm is the new truth in light of novel facts. Why was this such a revolutionary finding? Or why was this book considered so important in the history of science? Well, it's because, and this is again, Kuhn's perspective, is that educational materials had uh, given the notion that science is cumulative because essentially textbooks want to portray a linear advancement of knowledge. And they get rewritten with each paradigm shift to make it seem like, well, this was an obvious way to think about things as we move forward. Um, so that, that's why this book is so important. I think it's still true. So if you'll allow me in the next uh, 30, 40, 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna take you through the history of medical paradigms and medical education starting from the very beginning. So as far as I can tell, the first medical paradigm and the first medical education paradigm was around 500 BC. And it was based on the observation at that time that deities controlled health and disease. And the, the model is on the right there so that if you had symptoms, they were because somebody had divinely visited upon you um, in, in a negative way. 
And what you would do is you would go and appeal uh, to a, another divination for um, uh, relief of your symptoms. And your course was dependent on which deity kind of prevailed in your behalf or to your detriment. So therefore, it was obvious that religious figures would dispense health care. And that would be the perpetuation of shrines and sacrifices and whatever other mechanisms were necessary to appease the deities and keep you in good health. Out of this comes the uh, god of uh, medicine and healing, Asclepius, with his single, um, sorted, single snake sore, um, staff. He was the uh, son of Apollo. The healing cult was dedicated to him. Interestingly, his daughter was the, da uh, was the goddess of cleanliness or hygiea of schools of public health and hygiene. Um, Asclepius was actually killed by Zeus because he was accused of raising the dead. I don't know, maybe he actually did minister to some people and got them well, um, but eventually he was killed by Zeus for, um, for doing the, uh, raising the undead. But if you accept that, then this could be the first tertiary referral center in the world. This was the uh, sanctuary of Asclepius at Coast Greece. This is where people went for advanced healthcare like they come now to your campus. The next paradigm shift comes in early Greece, again, sometime in, in the hundreds of uh, years BC. And that is because of the birth of the scientific method. Um, that was perpetuated by Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, who advocated for observation and reason and deduction. And if you, again, remember when I said that technology was the kind of the way that people collect a lot of these facts, what their basic observation that they could make that was unquestioned was that liquid was the source of life. This, in the spring, rains came, clouds would uh, let rain, plants would regrow. They knew that if you drained a tree of its sap, uh, the plant would die. Similarly, if you drained a human of its sap or its blood, the human would die. Therefore, it was entirely logical for them to think and, co and construct a medical paradigm around the fact that liquid was the source of life. And out of that, Around that time was Hippocrates, again, 370 to 460 BC. <clears throat> he was actually probably the greatest ever lab, lab leader because the, Hippocrat the Hippocratic corpus is over 70 medical works that only people remember his name to and none of them remember his grad students. So none of his grad students got any credit. He got all the credit for the Hippocratic corpus, which is over 70 medical works. He is going to start and he's going to be the founder of what I call the next great, the, the father of uh, the next um, paradigm of medicine. And his paradigm is going to actually last 1500 years. And his paradigm is what we've all heard of as the humoral theory paradigm. And that essentially comes out of a combination of Aristotelian beliefs um, in a two by two model of between cold and wet and hot and dry, uh, hot and cold, wet and dry or the four elements, water, air, fire, and earth. But out of that, Hippocrates, I'm giving credit for, but others built the humoral theory where we were composed of four humors, blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, and that each one of these was important for maintaining health. Each one of these came from a specific organ. Blood came from the heart, yellow bile came from the liver, black bile came from the spleen, and interesting, for us, those uh, the pulmonary po folks in the off in the uh, in the in the in the audience, phlegm actually originally came from the brain. Um, these were aligned to not only complexion but also temperament. So that if you were phlegmatic, you were thought to be unemotional and calm. If you were melancholic, you ha you had a predisposition to have a lot of black bile, and that meant you were thoughtfully sad. If you were choleric, you had a lot of fire, or you had yellow bile and you were quick to anger. And if you were predominantly uh, composed of blood or sanguine, you actually were optimistic and positive. So they related all of these four humors to health, to disposition, et cetera. And they constructed an entire medical uh, paradigm out of this. And this is actually directly quoted from the Hippocratic uh, corpus. He, what he wrote was, the human body contains blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. These are the things that make up its constitution and cause its pains and health. Here's the key point. Health is primarily a state in which these constituent substances are in a correct proportion to each other, both in strength, quantity, and are well mixed. 
So we want to have the right balance and we want the right mixing. But he went on to um, um, go on and say, to, to briefly, you know, to put it briefly, the physician should treat disease by the principle of opposition to the cause of the disease according to its form. So that meant if you had an imbalance of your humors, you wanted to restore balance. Um, and out of this comes things like um, uh, cupping and um, enemas and bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. They were all efforts to kind of restore your, um, your balance. But he also made the observation of heredity, which is kind of cool, because he wrote that a phlegmatic child is born of a phlegmatic parent, et cetera, et cetera. So they knew about heredity because they observed it. Uh, they didn't have, obviously, the mechanisms to explain it, but they said that that the, the child of, of the parent was born with the same balance of humors as the parent. So they understood heredity. How did they explain widespread disease then? They explained it by the uh, morbid secretion of bad humors or so-called miasma in the air. And, that's, and if you breathed in miasma, it could throw your humors out of balance. And that was treated by decreasing food or fluid to breathe less air. I think out of this came that old adage that my grandmother may or may not have ever said is either starve a fever and, and feed a cold or vice versa. I never knew what it was, but I'm sure it comes out of this. Galen, the Roman physician, took the humoral um, paradigm to its next level. He was a Roman who lived about 200 AD and he lived in a time where function was determined by God. He was a teleologist as opposed to a naturalist. So they believed that we had eyes, that God gave us eyes so that we could see. Um, it turns out that this approach, this teleologic approach, later appealed to both the Christian and the Islamic traditions and may have been one of the reasons why this paradigm is gonna stick around for so long. But Galen did some really good um, anatomical work. Uh, dissection of humans was not really well approved of, so most of what he did was in animals but he defined bone and muscle structure. He figured out that the kidneys produce urine, not the bladder, which was the obvious thing that people thought just from observation. He did a lot of really good neuroanatomy. He defined seven out of the 12 cranial nerves. He got the meninges. He also got uh, contralaterality with injuries of the head correct. Um, he defined the spinal cord and paralysis. And he actually also came up with, understood that arteries and veins were different blood vessels. He did not discern the systemic or the pulmonic connections, which is why he's going to get it wrong. But this is actually the Galenic physiology. And if you think about the fact that they had no microscopy, they had little dissection, and all they really had was the powers of observation, it actually is pretty cool. So in their physiology, the brain was the seat of the soul's rational faculties. If you didn't have a brain, <clears throat> you couldn't be rational. It was the source of the nerves, which controlled sensation and motor functions. They got that right. The heart, which was the seat of the passions, sent out the arteries and sent out life-giving arterial blood and vital spirit. They understood digestion. So they knew that you ate food, it went into the portal circulation, it went to the liver, and then the liver theoretically sent nutrition out of the veins. So what they had was a set of arteries and veins that existed in parallel with no connection. But again, think about if all you had was just pure observation, this is actually pretty good and it's pretty hard to shake that down. And it doesn't get shaken down for another couple of thousand years or so. So throughout the dark ages and the Renaissance, uh, the humoral theory persisted. They treated with opposition theory, as I mentioned. Drugs were, they did have drugs and they, they were thought to work via alchemy i.e. they were able to shift one humor into another humor. So if a drug worked, it's because it made one humor into a different humor. They understood surgery and cartery. They, um, they coped with the Black Plague and they explained the Black Plague and the bubonic plague through miasma. And many people ascribe the fact that there was little scientific progress during this time because the church controlled science. Many metaphors for now. In my reading, I'm going to give credit, and I'm a physiologist, so of course I'm, I'm biased this way, to overcoming the Galenic uh, paradigm with the physiology paradigm in the late 1500s, early 1600s, instigated by William Harvey. Who was William Harvey? He was an Englishman who left to study at, at Padua, um, where uh, his colleagues at Padua were included Fabricus, Galileo, Descartes, Bacon, Boyle. So it was a very fertile intellectual environment. 
Uh, he joined the College of Physicians in 1615, and his first important work was uh, on the whole of anatomy, which was a really good anatomical compilation in 1616. But the reason we know his name is because in 1628, he published De Motu Cordis, which is concerning the motion of the heart. And what he's going to do is he's going to describe the circulation. Remember, Galen had two parallel systems for the arteries and the veins. Uh, Harvey is going to propose and prove a circulation. Now, it's true that, um, that the, the great um, Arab physician Ibn al-Nafis got pretty close to this because he questioned some of Galen's ideas and he got close to a circulation. But the guy who actually got it right about 50 or 70 years before uh, Harvey, but nobody knows about, was a Spanish genius named Cervetus. And at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll show you a picture of a book which everybody should read. He was an amazing guy. The trouble was he was um, kind of, he pissed off the, the Protestants of the time in Switzerland and the Catholics at the time uh, because he didn't believe in the Holy Trinity and he, he, he believed in a lot of things. So he was also a heretic and a scientist. But it turns out he wrote a book where he described the circulation very accurately, even including the pulmonary circulation, which predates William Harvey. But the trouble was that he, because he pissed off so many people, he actually got burned at the stake um, about 30 years before um, De Motu Cordis, um, along with every copy of his book, allegedly. It is actually, his book is actually considered the rarest of all rare books in the world. Um, and and uh, at the end, when, you, when I mentioned that book, Out of the Flames, I would recommend it highly. But this is the only figure in his book which throws out Galenic physiology. And it's, it's a trivial experiment that we do on ourselves all the time. And he essentially just did, he defined the flow of veins back to the heart by doing the variable pressure that as you can see in figure three here. But this single book uh, was the precipitating factor that overturned the uh, humoral uh, paradigm and brought in uh, the, phys uh, the physiology one. But look what he wrote. This is directly taken from De Motu Cordis. I have, this is Harvey writing. I have come to a conclusion so novel and unheard of character that I not only fear injury to myself from the envy of a few, but I tremble lest I have mankind at large for my enemies. All he's doing is pressing on veins and he's worried that he's gonna uh, have mankind at large for his enemies. Um, maybe he knew about Servetus, I don't know. But he again, he goes on to run, uh, um, write that he began to wonder if, if the, uh, blood flow had a movement as it were in a circle and he verified that. <clears throat> and so he came to the, he figured out the left ventricle, out the arteries and back the veins. So he called, the, he defined the circular motion. He actually calculated based on flow calculations, very remedial flow calculations that he did, that the liver, if it was to have a parallel circulation, the liver would have to produce three times the body weight and blood per hour. He defined the four chambered heart. Other people came on and did more science to follow that. Even before microscopies, Malpighi hypothesized that capillaries would connect the arteries and the veins. A hundred years before oxygen was to, um, discovered, Louver uh, uh, described how blood changed from purple to scarlet after passing through the lungs. And again, they didn't even know about oxygen at this point, but they made all these observations. Microscopy comes about later in the 1600s, early 1700s. Um, you cannot measure metabolism until you can actually me measure weight accurately. This was done by Sanctorius. Um, oxygen, as I mentioned, was me uh, and which is also the subject of a good story, was mentioned, uh, was discovered in the 1770s. So all of this is leading to the establishment of what I call the physiology paradigm. But what's missing? It's the miasma. What's explaining widespread disease? And in my non-historians, non-philosophers viewpoint, next you have to bring on the microbial contagion paradigm. And I give credit to Jenner for variolation and smallpox vaccination, Semmelweis for hand washing and purple, eliminating purple fever. Interesting story there. He was opposed by Verkow, who did not believe in hand washing, by the way. Uh, Pasteur came up with germ theory, vaccination, pasteurization. And then Koch puts it all together in the late 1800s with his postulates. He also defines vectors for the first time. So here's pictures of Jenner, Semmelweis, Pasteur, and Koch, who I give credit for the microbial pathogen uh, paradigm. And what I consider is that these two paradigms coalesce <clears throat> to define what I'm calling the modern medical, uh, bi modern biomedical paradigm 
of the 20th century. And all of these are great Nobel winners who I, I in my mind, um, perform the normal science within that paradigm. Some people will bicker about whether DNA was paradigm changing. I don't think it was because <clears throat> people always knew there was a mechanism of heredity. They just didn't know what the, the, the exact molecule was. So I think DNA was normal science, albeit very important, but I thought that that was part of the normal science. So I'm gonna switch quickly and to say, okay, I made the point that medical education should follow medicine. What about medical education paradigm in the United States? I suspect almost nobody in this audience, if they didn't go th rotate through Hopkins, knows who either of these two people are. But these two women are singularly, or not singularly, doubly responsible for how medical education is administered in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Mary Elizabeth Grant, Grant, Garrett was a phila the philanthropist who donated the $350,000 necessary to open the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. M. Carrie Thomas was her neighbor, her lifelong friend. She was the second president of Bryn Mawr College. She was the first woman in the United States to get a PhD. And she conspired with Mary Elizabeth Garrett to impose upon Johns Hopkins School of Medicine certain conditions for when it opened in 1883. Um, <clears throat> and that is uh, 18, 1893, I apologize. So Johns Hopkins School of Medicine was the first school of medicine in the United States where medicine was a graduate. You had to have a four-year degree to enter the School of Medicine. It was also co-educational from its inception. It created a four-year, what so-called two plus two curriculum, preclinical and clinical curriculum. It reduced lectures, emphasized seminars, uh, instigated bedside teaching thanks to William Osler, integrated basic sciences with the clinical mentoring, fostered the first ever relationship between a hospital, a formal relationship between a hospital and medical school, and engaged in structures and research and made preclinical professors full-time teachers. So this was the model, which I think resonates with all of us, given that we're all educated with this model, that was founded at Johns Hopkins in 1893 as a condition for Mary Elizabeth Garrett giving the money to open the School of Medicine. She insisted on this. The Board of Trustees fought her for three years. I have another whole talk about how they fought her. Um, but they, because they thought that nobody would come to medical school if they needed a four-year degree, much less be able to speak French and German at the same time, which was also a requirement. The reason why I think that we have this medical school and, uh, and we are the only country to have this as our only medical school uh, paradigm is because in 1910, Abraham Flexner wrote the Flexner Report. Oh, this is William Osler and bedside teaching, by the way. And it's also true, um, uh, as Jeff Connors knows, that uh, William Oser really created residency education as we know it now. Here's the, here's the uh, Flexner report. So the Flexner report said he visited every single medical school in the country, and he said that Hopkins should be the model of its kind. This was funded by the Carnegie Foundation, and that started a whole uh, wave of activity where it was thought that medical schools should become professional schools. And, and many, many schools, and in fact, um, uh, the government even said that the Hopkins model should be the model by which we all should aspire to train medical school uh, students. So that's the way, that's why we have a four-year medical school that is postgraduate. Um, that's where the two plus two model came from that most of us or many of us were educated from. It all dates back to 1893. Now I knew Rick Albert was gonna ask me, well, what about the University of Colorado? So I actually pulled up and I found Here's the entry for the University of Colorado in the Flexner Report. It was based in Boulder back then, as you all uh, should know. Um, the population was 9,000. Uh, the entrance requirement was a four-year high school education, if that's all you had. At that time, you see that uh, Flexner visited in April, April of 1909. They had 85 students, 25 professors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the budget was very, very low. What's really interesting and notice there that the clinical facilities are entirely inadequate. Um, and this is also at the end of, uh, he wrote general considerations for every school. He, so Colorado at that time was overcrowded with doctors. In 1912, the Colorado state legislature passed a law saying that all applicants for a medical license must have at least one year of college. Flexner wrote that this is a change in practice, not education. And this is direct quote from the Flexner report. The university may continue to train low-grade men for adjacent states. Obviously, it was not co-ed, but I guess those adjacent men, those adjacent states were Wyoming and other places near you guys, Texas, I imagine. 
Um, he also wrote, it is important, therefore, as a first step that the university gain access to the clinical facilities in Denver. And you all did that in, I think, 1924 or so. But I'm not going to tell you your history. So as far as I'm concerned, the medical curriculum model, the paradigm of all of the 1900s was this machine model where year one was normal, year two was abnormal, which I consider an abnormal, which I consider a absolutely full, uh, uh, wrong assumption. And then three years three and four were clinical clerkships, which were typ typically departmental. And this, was, this model really perpetuated the notion that the human is a machine and we should consider it either a broken machine or a well-running machine. And I think that that paradigm, which many of us were trained under, um, we're now, we've fortunately now left that paradigm. There were tensions to the paradigm in the 1900s, uh, in the 1990s and 2000. A lot of schools reform their curriculum, but I do not consider any of these paradigm changing reforms. I consider these normal science reforms. A lot of things were going on. A lot of medical schools de-departmentalized. A lot of schools uh, integrated courses, including Hopkins, by the way. Um, a lot of the um, patient-centered clerkships grew, ambulatory clerkships grew, et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of external factors to change uh, curricula, a lot of societal factors, multidisciplinary topics, uh, biomedical ethics, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as I'm concerned, these were not paradigm changing. These were all normal science and tinkering to the basic machine model. So um, this is uh, two, peop uh, two people talking to each other. I don't know who's speaking, uh, but he, one of them says, look, I can't promise I'll change, but I can promise I'll pretend to change. Um, so I don't think that these were changing paradigms. This was the um, chair of the Department of History of Medicine, Oswe Temkin, um, back in, in the early 1980s and 90s. And he wrote, uh, in 1963, again, another prescient comment, there is no science of the individual. Modern medicine suffers from a fundamental contradiction. Its practice deals with the individual while its theory grasps universals only. So he was understanding there's a tension between the individual and the so-called machine model. Um, and that um, paradigm shift is gonna be precipitated by this in 2003 which was the elucidation of the reference genome, the um, breakthrough of uh, human scientific, uh, human genetic variation in 2007, and the ability to um, sequence genomes and understand the great degree of human variability that nobody had, people had hypothesized, but we now fully understood the mechanism behind it. And so what I'm gonna call the next paradigm, the paradigm we're in now, is the individuality or human uh, variability paradigm. And I'll talk more about that for the rest of the time. And it's not only just genes, it's not a gene thing. It turns out that it's about understanding that our health is determined by many things, internal and external. And after, and um, this is the most unreadable book I'll mention. This is Barton Childs, a great pediatric geneticist at Hopkins who came into my office when I ran the human pathophysiology course at Hopkins and said, Charlie, I'd like to read all of your notes because I think you're teaching the Hopkins medical school students wrong. He wrote this book, which is remarkably unreadable because it's filled with sentences like this, but he hit the nail on the head. He wrote that diseases are caused by the independent action of neither genes nor experiences, but by the influence of each on the protein products that are the unit steps of homeostasis of specific individuals in whom they coincide for reasons traceable to phylogeny and culture. Imagine a 325 page book filled with these sentences. It is, there's only, I, I, as best I can tell, there's only four people in the country that have ever read this book. Um, <clears throat> he explained it to me this way. Here's how he explained it to me and I finally understood what he was talking about. This is a, a, a lecture that we gave in our second year of medical school during the endocrine bone section <clears throat> where we made the point that this is a graph of bone mineral density in women, black women and black dots, white women and white dots, making the point, and we taught that as women age, their bone mineral density declines. Barton came to me and said, Charlie, you're, you're teaching them wrong. You're teaching them the curves. The message is in the error bars. What you should be teaching is that some women have dramatic bone mineral density loss as they age, and some women have almost none at all. 
And the important job for our Hopkins students is to figure out is why one woman is going to have dramatic loss and the other one is not. When he said that to me, it's like the light went off and I understood what they'd been talking about, about human variability and how to um, educate. And based on that conversation and, some, and the conversation Barton had with other people, we spent five years at Hopkins reforming our medical school curriculum to develop a new framework. So it's not that we're not teaching physiology and genetics and stuff like that. We're starting our students with a central framework that starts with the patient. Every patient has a phenotype. Where they are on that phenotype, they can be anywhere between risk and latency and critical illness or some combination thereof. And where they are on that continuum is based on what's going on inside their body, modulated by what's going on outside their body. So all of these factors influence individual patients in different ways to understand the balance between health and disease. Now, and, and this is how we it spent, we spent five years figuring out how to teach this to medical school students in a rational framework. And hopefully uh, um, Brian Wolf graduated before it, but hopefully we've, we've, we've succeeded because I think this is the way we as clinicians practice medicine. So what is the individuality model of medical education? How do we define disease? It's an alteration, individual homeostasis. Why do humans get disease? Like Barton said, it's your intrinsic makeup and external factors. Why do people get disease? But more as sometimes as importantly, why do lots of people not get disease? That's often an underlooked question. Why does this person sick now, not yesterday or the day before? That can often help us understand things. What can we do to restore this person to their unique steady state? And how can we utilize our knowledge of this individual to prevent disease and maintain health? <clears throat> we received a lot of opposition for wanting to throw out the Hopkins Medical School curriculum, which had been you know, kind of there for a lot of years and come up with this new framework. Um, but we, we, I, I used to pull out this slide a lot where uh, Robert Watson, the first president of IBM said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Um, and later on, and more and more literature came out in the late 1990s um, and early 2000s about the relationship between individuals and the environment in a variety of diseases, depression, asthma, osteoporosis, obviously cancer. This is the cancer people are way ahead of the rest of us in this. They know this better than any of us. Um, and then, of course, the, thinking about this in terms of every individual, that's not feasible. So I think the precision medicine initiative advocated by uh, Barack Obama here, um, I, I won't make any other comments. Um, he's right. Doctors have always recognized that every patient is unique and doctors have always tried to tailor their treatments in best they can to individuals. But prior to this, we've been using a machine model, but now we're coming out with, we have the knowledge, we have the observational powers and the technology transformations to do this in a more precise way. So I think the amalgamation of individuals into more precise subgroups is where we're going with this initiative. Interestingly, Oser got it right also in 1903. He wrote that variability is the law of life and as no two faces are the same, no two bodies are alike, no two individuals react alike and behave alike under the abnormal conditions we know as a disease. He knew the right answer. He just didn't have the tools to get to analyzing the problem correctly, whereas now we do. I'm gonna leave you with a couple thoughts about how we're approaching this at Hopkins. So we're taking the individuality paradigm and we're saying, how do we make it functional and feasible and scalable into our clinical practice and also our medical education? And I would I'd urge people who are interested in this to read this uh, editorial in the JCI by Anthony Rosen and Scott Seeger. And the, bio, the bottom line is that the way to move this forward is by discovering clinically relevant and me mechanistically anchored subgroups at scale. And the way we're doing that, or no, the tools that we're using this for, and what, what Scott and Anthony propose is that we're allowed to do this now, the time is right to adopt this paradigm, because there's been a revolution in technology characterized by three important revolutions. A revolution in measurement, where we can now look at genes, proteins, metabolites. We can look at everything. We can measure so many more things that we could never measure before. We then can, the revolution in computation, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody, we can take huge amounts of data and try to analyze it. And we can look for mechanisms. We can look for relationships that, we, that the human eye could never see. 
And then finally, the revolution in connectivity allows us to collect data far more quickly and far more importantly, and then take that data and get it translated into actions. So at Hopkins, we've developed what we call the precision medicine analytics platform, which assumes that patients with the same diagnosis have different trajectories and responses to disease and experienced pat clinicians can see these patterns and subgroups, but how do we make it into a more mechanistic, analyzable research and reproducible uh, uh, format? So what we've done here is combined utilizing a lot of technology, a discovery platform that interfaces with a delivery platform where we're challenging clinicians who are taking care of patients to bring our, their data together, all of their data, not just genetics, but everything, use modern analytic tools to figure out whether we can identify small subgroups of patients within a larger disease category. Um, and what they're doing is they're able to take all the data from our EPIC system and all other systems that we have, imaging, monitors, even monitors in the ICU are putting data into this if you'd like to. And they can take all these things together. And what they're asking clinicians to do is say, okay, if you have a disease, tell us what data you would like us to collect over time on all of your patients and, and what outputs you think are relevant that could help you understand better how to care for your patients. And so far we've approved and we funded internally mostly centers to do this kind of analysis for all of these disease mentioned here. Um, now the results are still nascent, but we are coming up with ideas and they are able to identify subgroups of phenotypes in some of these diseases. I would say multiple sclerosis and bladder cancer are the two that we have that are the farthest uh, ahead. And if anybody wants more information on this, I'm happy to share that. So what are the implications of the individuality paradigm for uh, physicians and students? It requires us to have an appreciation of complexity and system biologies. I think we're gonna have new ways of looking at mechanisms of disease. I think we're gonna have new definitions of disease. One example of that is Anthony Rosen's important observation that some patients with scleroderma, their scleroderma is actually an immunologic response to an incipient or nascent cancer. So it's almost like an, um, it's the side effect of, of our innate immune therapy against cancer. That's what scleroderma is in some patients. That's a new definition of disease as far as I'm concerned. I think we're gonna make progress by identifying relevant subgroups. I think we need to think about risk and prevention differently. We need to think about risk and prevention both on an individual level and on a public health thing. COVID is a great example about how we have to protect everybody, but we're also understanding that certain individuals are more at risk of getting COVID than others. I think that um, especially our cardiologists have to rethink evidence-based medicine. I think a lot of studies that were done before clumped a lot of uh, phenotypes together into a big group and they might've missed important signals. I think we have to understand what is important about understanding mechanistically and um, uh, clinical research wise, how do we identify relevant subgroups so that if there's a small signal somewhere, we don't miss it. Think CRP, think the role of statins, think of many things where we might've had, and, and God knows pulmonary is, is rampant with negative trials. I think some of those trials missed a signal because we didn't identify our patients accurately enough, for example, with sepsis or ARDS. I do think that as a result of this, there's already been a resurgence of the history and patient contact. And I think pharma industry is gonna play a big role of this. I think the notion about a drug that everybody should take across the board is, gonna, is no longer there, but I think individually tailored precision drugs are already happening for many places beyond cancer. So to close, as far as I am concerned, we're in the midst, I think we're in the middle years of a paradigm shift in medicine relating to individuality and, and variability. I think the natural conclusion of that is gonna be precision medicine. I think physicians and scientists need to be trained in this paradigm to advance clinical care and research. We should do all the things I've mentioned and physicians need to know their individual patients. We've got to, you've gotta get a good family history. You've gotta know where they live. You've gotta know their community influences. You gotta know what their indoor exposures are because you will not be able to take care of patients without understanding their environment, their community, their social status, and all of those things that we know are very important. I think medical training curricula must include the conceptual framework of individuality, moving into precision as, as, a, as an approach. And I also will acknowledge that truth is dynamic and it must be uh, advanced and modified through research. 
um, although I do not believe in non-alternative facts. So with that, I will say thank you. Um, it's an honor. I, would, I honestly would have loved to have been there in person uh, to see you all in person. Um, sometimes it does help to turn a question around, why not you? And these are the three books that I will recommend people do. These are readable books. Um, and I think that if anybody's interested in these topics or these thoughts, uh, the middle one is a biography of Mary Elizabeth Garrett, a fascinating woman of the um, Gilded Age, Osler. And uh, the one on the far right there is the story of Servetus, uh, which is a great read. So with that, I will close. And David, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Shirley, thank you very much. That was an <clears throat> incredibly provocative um, the lecture and uh, there are a number of questions that we have. Um, maybe if we could leave that last slide up, is that possible just so that folks sure. can take down the notes related to the um, uh, those books? Um, let me start off with uh, the first question that I have, which is, um, I, I agree with you that science does advance uh, through paradigm shifts. Medicine advances through paradigm shifts. The, the, the question that I have for you is that not all paradigm shifts uh, end up being um, um, uh, validated. Uh, and, and so talk about the paradigm shifts that, that end up being dead, dead ends and, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the necessary step of validating the, uh, the new approaches and, and the novel thinking. Yeah, so I, I won't go into the dead end, I, I, but I, th I, think, I, I think that I'm going to step back one step farther back and, 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 and go back to what Osher said, is that many of them, you know, kind of uh, wither off and die, David. I, I think many ideas that we've had that we thought were revolutionary ideas, um, where we tried to fit the data into a new explanation, just could not be sustained with rigorous and reproducible investigation. Um, so I, I don't think those make it to be paradigm shifts. I think they may be, you know, kind of um, crazy ideas that are worth pursuing, but they don't pan out. So I don't think they instigate paradigm shifts, but I think they do do exactly what Osa was saying and Kuhn was saying is that they create novelties of fact that you have to chase down because they're going to give you a new understanding. Um, you know, and, and, and how many, I have a hypothesis that if you, if you um, and I think the advent of the, the reversal of the publication bias against negative trials has helped perpetuate uh, or d uh, dissuade people that only good results are, are, are positive results. So mm -hmm. I don't think I totally answered your question, but I think uh, what you're talking about is exactly what Osa was talking about, about the germs of truth that wither and die. Yeah, I love the quote from Harvey also, um, uh, where, he, um, where he was um, somewhat skeptical and also fearful of his observations in terms of how they would be accepted. And I think that that speaks to the importance of following the data. Yeah, and, and it also speaks to the fact that, you know, like, look, <clears throat> the worst thing that can happen to us is we get a grant rejected or somebody says that's a bad idea. I mean, there it seems to them like the stakes were much higher back then. So we should be happy we live in calmer times. So we, I, I very much resonate with your view of uh, bringing personalized um, approaches to understanding human physiology and taking care of patients. But there are a lot of questions in terms of implementation and operationalizing uh, this at the patient's bedside. What's the role of the physician in this process? The physician's at the center. I think that, um, I, I, I <clears throat> And I think this, this uh, is important for the medical student and for the residency training program directors and the fellowship directors, because I think if we don't take a good history, we're not gonna understand. Remember, I, I strongly believe in this uh, notion that uh, individual health is influenced by your intrinsic makeup and what happens to you on the outside. And if you don't explore that deeply, um, you're not gonna know exactly what's going on. So I think taking a good history and then the other thing I'll say is that every single one of these PMAP things that we're doing, these are instigated by clinicians. So the clinician says, okay, for multiple sclerosis uh, or COPD, here's all the data I would love to know about every patient who is characterized, who I see in the clinic with COPD. And at the end, I'm going to say, and here's the outputs I'm going to see so that I can try to figure out what is the clinical subtype. This is all driven 
by clinicians. This is not driven by anybody else because the clinicians are the ones that can identify the phenotypes. And it gets back to Osler's quotation is that they've always, you know, good clinicians, and I, I do not include myself in that, but I know you have some in your department, have always been able to identify these subgroups or these variants um, that even though they may all have COPD, they behave very differently. But it's not just one person typically, there's small groups of people. So this is all driven by clinic. I think precision medicine is all driven by clinicians. Uh, and it also does require you talking to your patient and getting to know them. So Charlie, reflect on how these, uh, how, uh, how a personalized approach relates to uh, race-based um, normative values for PFTs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Ethnic-based and stuff in pooled data. So. Um, I, I just, I, I think we have to, I, there's still going to be public health. There's still going to be, no matter what, and, and public, look, I, I fully agree. Uh, the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, I, I believe in deeply. And I agree with every great, the greatest innovations we've had to save more lives have been from the School of Public Health, where we've done something to everybody, not just a few people, water, air, vaccines. So I think we're still gonna to need to be clumpers at the same time, even though a lot of this is driving, the research is driving becoming a splitter. Um, and the balance between what things we consciously do to everybody, knowing we don't need to do it to everybody versus those things that um, we do need to split out because we think it makes an important difference. I think that's gonna be a lot of what happens in the next 15 or 20 years, David including whether or not we normalize PFTs based on more precise measurements than, than whatever sex is, um, height, and age. So, so thinking about the didactics related to, or the disciplines related to medical education, what are the new disciplines that need to be incorporated? And what are we going to do with the traditional disciplines uh, like anatomy, physiology, um, immunology, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's partly that's why it took us five years. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why it took us five years. <clears throat> Those disciplines are no less important and they're becoming more important all the time. The question is the framework by which you teach the student. So if you teach the student anatomy, for example, um, we all know that, 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 that there's a huge amount of anatomic variation that goes on uh, with people but I can promise you that I was not taught that anatomy. Um, so I think you frame it within the context of anatomy and I don't use the words normal and abnormal anymore. I use typical and atypical because um, I don't know what normal is, frankly. I know typical because that's common, um, but I also know that there's a huge amount of variability. So I think the disciplines are no less important. Um, and I think the certain disciplines like communication and humanism and all those kinds of things and understanding environment and socioeconomics have become more important because of the top part of my, my, my individual paradigm. But the bottom part, all the internal stuff that goes on is no less important. It's just that we should not teach it that it's, we should be teaching the error bars, not the curve for all of it. Uh, expand your comments about the error bars a little bit. Uh, um, there are a few that are confused about that. The error bars are all about variability. The error bars, and you know, it's, it's like in, in pulmonary, we, we teach all the time that no patient has ever presented with a classic PE, but we keep teaching the triad of what the classic PE is, but nobody ever has it. Um, the error bars are the variability and the bone mineral density is the one that taught it to me is that um, we should be teaching, uh, we should be teaching, yes, there are many women who lose a lot of bone, and, and a lot of people in your audience know more than Nicole Rothman knows much more about this than I do, but women who lose bone mineral density and we should be addressing them. But we also know that there's a lot of 80 year old, you know, white women who have, who's never had a fracture. Why is that different? We should be teaching our students the error bars here, not that the curve is what's normal, it's that the error bars indicate that the variability is we should be teaching the notion that you're gonna, you're gonna have to figure out whether your patient is a rapid loser, a middle loser, or a non-loser. And that's the framework. So you're still teaching the same contact, content, you're just teaching it in a different context. And, and um, 
and pushing the student to understand the drivers that um, that push a, a, an individual to be um, to fall into one of those. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So, um, is it necessary, or and if it is, how are you going to prove that this approach uh, adds value? That sounds like the reviewers at New England Journal when we sent our article and it got rejected. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I didn't review your article. <laughs> um, is it necessary? Um, I think. I think the truth will. I, I think time will tell. I, I don't. I, I. It's 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 a hard thing to test because when you take high, you know, what is your outcome measure? Are you a better doctor, et cetera, et cetera? And I, I don't have a good way to do that. And it's it's, it's why I, I love physiology and I hate process. Um, I, I, I hate process. Um, so I don't have a good answer to that, but, but I, I absolutely believe that this approach to thinking about patients and their disease, every astute clinician I've ever spoken to, and even a few non-astute clinicians, think is the right way to do it. And therefore, I think we should not be so arrogant to think that our medical students cannot understand that approach from day one. Um, but you're right, it's going to be hard to prove that it's better than a different system. Mm -hmm. Any uh, remaining thoughts that you have, Charles, Charlie? No, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to unshare my screen if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's truly an honor to be part here and, and uh, I'm hoping I can come visit you all in person sometime in 2021, 2022, sometime yeah. after that. We very much enjoyed your talk and, um, and it'll give us a lot of food for thought in terms of our education and also the ways in which we can incorporate precision medicine at the bedside. We're struggling to do that as many places are. I, I think it's a worthwhile thought. I think uh, involving the clinicians and um, thinking about um, subgroups. I think, I think the, the, the translation, the practical, the practical approach is by identifying, understanding subgroups. Um, individuality is the right answer. I know that, but practically speaking, subgroups become the way to translate it into a feasible mechanism to um, to take it uh, to large scale to training and education. Good. That's what I think. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for taking the time, and great meeting you. And we'll see you again. And uh, all thank you to all of the University of Colorado people that I know. Love you. Bye bye. <laughs>